Good afternoon uh, and welcome to our uh, European Values Security Center for <laughs> I'm sorry, European Values Center for Security Policies talk uh, with the name The Role of Media in Disinformation Campaigns. Is there a way how to regulate them? And this is a big topic. And uh, I think we will have a lot to discuss with our brilliant speakers today. Uh, we have, uh, just to uh, very quickly introduce everyone, Marketa Gregorova, member of the European Parliament for the Czech Pirate Party. We have Monika Richter, media expert from the Semantic Visions. Oksana Romanyuk, executive director of the Institute of Mass Information from Ukraine. Katerina Smatsina, independent political analyst from Belarus. And Viktoras Daukskas, head of the debank.eu initiative, Lithuania. Uh, our debate today is a joint effort of European Values Center for Security Policy and texte.org.ua. And the debate has been funded by the European Union through the Black Sea Trust Fund for Regional Cooperation, a project of the German Marshall Fund. I really do hope that uh, we will spend the next hour, maybe hour and a half, uh, with a meaningful discussion. And if anybody from the audience would like to contribute or ask anything, please do so in the comments uh, on the stream. We will see all those questions and pose it to our speakers. So I would like to start by giving everybody space for their initial remarks. And my initial introductory question for most of you is basically if you could talk about your experience with uh, regulation from your respective countries or regions or organizations what is the role of the media and their regulation in fighting disinformation what are the pros of regulations and cons of it in your opinion and i would like to start with uh, Ms. marketa gregorova Oh, thank you very much for the honor and also for being here with you today. I look forward for the discussion. Also, of course, as I am a member of the European Parliament, my point of view will be mostly from this institution. Uh, I will not focus that much on the Czech Republic, even though I am sure that we will be able to get there uh, in the discussion. So. Uh, Disinformation is as old as our ability to paint on rocks, I'd say. And it has affected our societies in various ways through millennia. And uh, now divisions are being amplified uh, to create chaos and beacle, beacon societal cohesion or to paint uh, an aggressor in a distorted light. Uh, one does not really need to read Primakov, Gerasimov or other Russian military theoreticians to understand what uh, Russia's plan is. Uh, but as Primakov states, uh, hybrid tools can be an instrument of risk management when hard power is too risky, costly or impractical. And the most effective way, uh, therefore, uh, to beat hybrid tools like disinformation is to tilt this equation risk of spreading this information must be increased to the spreader. How to increase that risk is the question then. Uh, financial, legal and uh, diplomatic uh, consequences must be a cost that is predictable to Russian troll farms. Vladimir Putin himself, Macedonian teenagers uh, and foreign and domestic oligarchs and other sources of mass disinformation. Right now it is way too cheap to spread disinformation. There is, however, a big danger in overreaction. I am not an advocate for censoring free human speech, art, parody or memes. We cannot close our digital media pluralism in the name of legislating disinformation. But what we can and must do is control the amplifiers of digital information. And here I am coming to the topic of both social media and media as a collective term. Legislation in the European Parliament is currently being negotiated to make it possible for public authorities to scrutinize the algorithms that allow harmful disinformation to spread to millions of users. And the goal must not be a foreign or domestic actor uh, who is able to buy themselves the ability to poison millions of minds with disinformation. Social media must be regulated as a utility and thus increase the cost or outright make it impractical to buy amplification for harmful disinformation. And the media, uh, as a collective term, needs state support in order to create quality journalism and content that is both informative and helpful to society. 
junk sites and disinformation farms do not need nor want quality journalists. The value of strong and functional public broadcasters as a counter to falsehoods and lies is obvious. And to allow quality information to rise from private and public sources, uh, the economic playing field must be fair. That means that public must know who is paying for what information, and I think this is crucial. So enforced transparency in financial flows to disinformation channels is the starting point to countering disinformation. That was also my final point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so next, I would ask Monica Richter from Semantic Visions to continue. I have this sort of tingling that maybe you will address social media as well, right? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Indeed, I will also address social media. Um, but I'd like to approach this topic a little bit more um, broadly, uh, because I think that oftentimes, you know, when we when we talk about disinformation, um, we are not uh, very clear in our in our concepts and definitions. And so, I mean, really, what what we're what we're concerned about uh, when it comes to um, um, the mitigation of disinformation, as is the um, common buzzword, uh, which was also, you know, something that we frequently talked about when I worked at the eStratcom task force at the European External Action Service up until last year. That, that term or that phrase actually doesn't capture the full range of digital harms that we are attempting to address um, for the sake of, of strengthening democracy, right? I mean, really, when we talk about mitigating disinformation, we're talking about um, something broader, which we could ca call, for example, um, digital information disorder. And there are you know, several um, individual problems that fall underneath that umbrella, right? A host of challenges that we are attempting to tackle. Um, there is, as um, Ms. Gregorova mentioned, um, foreign election interference and disinformation campaigns coming from external threat actors who are seeking to use them as part of a hybrid agenda to undermine democracy. Um, then we have the um, um, spread of online harms, including hate speech and extremist and polarizing content, uh, health misinformation in, in the context of COVID, um, which are uh, trends that are being exacerbated effectively by the very business model um, of our digital information architecture, social media platforms. Um, and then we also have, you know, the even, even broader and more, more complex and elusive problem of the erosion of public trust in democratic institutions, um, low levels of media literacy, um, trust in, in elites as well, and in the, um, in, in the mainstream, whether political or otherwise. Um, all of these issues are part of the same problem. They're all symptoms of digital information disorder. Uh, but importantly, they are different um, and individually complex problems that accordingly require individualized solutions. Um, and that is something that most of the EUs, and by that I mean both individual member states and the EU institutions themselves, um, that Europe's counter disinformation architecture or efforts to date um, have so far proven vastly under equipped um, to, to address. So one of the things that, that I would call for when it comes to any discussions of, um, you know, regulation of the media, whether social media or otherwise, i.e. information sources that serve as avenues for the proliferation of um, um, types of content that undermine democracy, um, um, we, we have to break it down and focus on the individual problems that constitute that um, much broader host of challenges. If we fail to do that, then um, you know, we, we basically um, end up confused a lot of the time, talking past each other. Uh, we get caught in these um, um, misunderstandings about, for example, um, you know, 
believing that some people are are attempting to um, uh, you know restrict freedom of expression, for example, when in fact uh, that's of course you know not what we are trying to do when we talk about the need to create a public interest digital information space. So the first thing again that that I advocate is definitional clarity, and we still have a very long way to um, um, achieving such a, a kind of conceptually clear structure um, as an underpinning for our um, regulatory efforts, I would say. And that leads to a lot of problems. Um, and an example of you know, what, what I mean by that in practice, one of the major frustrations that I encountered working for the eStratcom task force, which was set up in 2015 to counter uh, specifically Russian disinformation efforts in um, the EU and against the um, um, you know, EU, EU neighborhood, um, was that, I mean, that was, it was an explicitly political um, agenda, right? I mean, this team was set up to counter Russian um, um, disinformation and influence efforts, um, specifically in context of, of the campaign that really um, um, rose up of, of the, uh, or following the annexation of Crimea. Um, but there were a lot of political forces at play um, within EU member states and within the institutions as themselves that were opposed to uh, treating um, this particular disinformation threat coming from you know, a, a foreign you know, hostile actor as a, a political problem requiring political solutions. Um, but really, I mean, that's, that's what it is. In the case of Russia, um, increasingly now also in, in the case of China, as we've seen during COVID, um, um, disinformation waged as political warfare requires political solutions. It requires the imposition of costs. It requires um, um, some form of deterrence. I'm not necessarily speaking in, in military terms that you certainly doesn't do traditional deterrence, right? But imposition of costs. Um, attempting to find um, technological or regulatory solutions to that particular problem is not going to address the root causes, which is that we have, again, a hostile threat actor that is hell-bent on undermining the very principles um, um, of democracy and um, its attendant um, liberal values. Um, and so, that requires a particular set of solutions that that you know are maybe beyond the scope of, of this conversation. Um, the the technological regulatory solutions, which um, the EU has sort of been mainly uh, kind of concerned with, um, I would say, uh, for for the last few years, in an attempt to deal with information disorder in an apolitical way. Um, uh, I mean, that's that's something that we are now seeing in improved form through the um, uh, Digital Services Act um, and the fact that there is now an increased focus on um, um, the root causes of um, um, information disorder on, on social media. Um, specifically the fact that um, social media platforms, um, Facebook in particular, but certainly not Facebook alone, um, are, are designed from the ground up in such a way to um, basically turn us, the users, into, um, um, into commodities uh, and to monopolize our attention in very, very toxic ways, uh, basically for, um, for, for commercial gain. Um, and democracy um, uh, and the, the, the public goods that are essential for, um, for democracy, like robust public debate, um, consensus and, uh, on, on you know, um, basic shared facts and reality, um, those, those, are, those are the casualties of, of the very design of the system. Um, anyway, so I'll leave it there for now. Um, um, we can return to some of these specifics later on in the discussion, but I just wanted to, um, you know, outline a little bit more of that um, conceptual framework that I think we should we should have when we approach a discussion like this. 
Thank you, Monica. And uh, I think I will definitely want to get back to several points you uh, you made. Uh, next, I would like to give the word to Oksana. Uh, and, uh, you know, Oksana, if in Ukraine, actually, there has been a lot of uh, regulatory or other measures taken by the government to stop the spread of mostly Russian disinformation or pro-Russian disinformation. Uh, some might consider those quite radical. Some might argue that it's actually necessary considering the state of play uh, which uh, Ukraine is in right now. So what is your experience? What is actually happening in Ukraine and what are the pros and cons in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, we do not have any regulation for the moment. There were attempts to carry out a kind of media reform, but everything halted. Uh, do you hear me well? Uh, sorry. Is it... Um, for uh, the recent uh, opinion polls uh, carried out by Samson Reuters in Ukraine by Internews Network show that the majority of population, not only in Ukraine, but in the region, they uh, use social platforms as their primary source of information. And uh, it is connected with coronavirus that people stayed at home and had to use uh, this uh, like of offline networking. But this had a really uh, um, terrible influence upon the situation, for instance, with vaccination in Ukraine, because huge amount of disinformation is spread through social platforms. Uh, just yesterday, I was shown three advertisements that were spread in Facebook, and uh, algorithm, algorithms did not detect it. And uh, we, as researchers, as academic society, we are very restricted now in even assessing the scope of this information in social platforms. They just hid the data and made it almost impossible for us to even to assess it. I think that this is a common problem today for many. And I'm saying nothing about TikTok, which is just, uh, if you uh, 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 press this hashtag vaccination in TikTok, for instance, in Ukraine, it would be just a, a drain pipe, sorry, it would be just a drain pipe of disinformation. And uh, we have a network in all regions of Ukraine, and we have observed a growth of disinformation since summer, uh, connected specifically with uh, coronavirus, with vaccination, and with uh, blaming international community, foreign society, foreign countries for like uh, situation with everything, with economics, with Afghanistan, with crisis. And uh, for us, it is very hard to do anything with that. We do not have uh, any legal um, office of uh, social platforms here in Ukraine. If you are a citizen of Southern Europe, you basically cannot defend your rights. You cannot apply to court uh, because the legal entity is in another country and uh, it's almost impossible. And um, internet used to be a good and it used to be free space, but we feel like we are in a situation when there is a, you know, this transition from a free space of information to uh, spaces of social platforms that are controlled by private entities uh, that are doing a lot to just increase their commercial uh, strong sides. And um, this is a very dangerous infrastructural transformation, which is um, really dangerous for such democracies as in the Southern Europe. Uh, specifically, if we mention about the uh, issues of digital uh, um, confidence, uh, access to data, they collect information about you, surveillance, disinformation, micro-targeting, uh, and increasing influence of social platforms upon processes in the society. As of today, these issues, they are regulated by market needs of these corporations. 
and they are not uh, like regulated by the law or I, i'm not talking here even about freedom of expression or disinformation i'm talking just the right of people uh and uh, we uh really are uh, deprived of uh, and even our rights and uh, what can be done in this situation last week we had a big conference in ukraine with regional journalists from all regions of ukraine and for the first time i heard from journalists the word the word trust they're very concerned that the audience is flowing to social networks and they are thinking a lot about how to return trust of the audience how to like get them back uh, to professional journalism um we are thinking now uh, well the issue of state support is rather controversial for our country we just successfully passed the reform of uh, the statization uh for us um, the very important issue is the support of public broadcasting company which is really independent uh, it should uh, be properly financed it should not be controlled by the government it should be really supported this first thing second thing we are now um, thinking about a partnership with uh, maybe businesses uh, socially responsible businesses who uh, want uh, who also care about uh, investments and uh, we suggest that business can support uh, independent quality media by even uh, giving them like 0.5 percent of their um, advertising budgets it is uh, for them it's a very low amount but for the media it would be a solution and uh, what else um, can be done here? Well, um, we are. Uh, I think we should raise the issue of not only regulation. It's uh, for sure. It is very necessary. We are. We really very well here. But we also should raise the issue of uh, ethics of communication. We used to talk a lot about journalism ethics but i think that issue of ethics should not be regulated by uh private corporations uh in ukraine we had instances of censorship uh, done by artificial intelligence i don't know uh when journalists media were just silenced and you just cannot to uh, return back uh to the social platform you have to find ways some tie to write personal emails you know it's not uh, serious it should not be that way uh, i think it should not be um, the sphere of regulation of private corporations it is it is just dangerous for democracies and i really welcome uh, the uh, efforts by uh, european union and uh, european commission uh, towards uh, this way uh, to deal with this disinformation disorder uh, this is a very very serious issue and uh, i can actually give you a lot of examples from uh, our territory how it looks like uh, when there is no media regulation uh, there is oligarchic um, television and there is a huge russian disinformation influence but but you can just look at the figures uh, how many people uh, are vaccinated in Ukraine? We are the worst country now in the Europe by the level of vaccination, and this is the result, uh, one of the results of uh, this disinformation in social platforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana. Uh, next, I would like to give the word to uh, Katia Shmatina. Uh, Katia, you come from a country which uh you know is a, on a slightly different level than most of us here when it comes to media regulation and state influence on the media so i presume your viewpoint is going to be a little bit different so please go ahead uh, good afternoon i'm happy to be part of this conversation and also apologize for the background noise um 
And indeed, the case of Belarus today is very different from well, the rest of the region we are talking about today. And I would say before the political crisis 2020, there was some room for negotiations or for conversation between the Belarusian independent journalist uh, networks uh, and some state agencies, and also a room for, let's say, like criticizing Belarusian state uh, reports, which were sometimes not very accurate or uh, were vulnerable to disinformation. But of course, after the uh, this continuous uh, over a year of repressions, the media landscapes changed drastically up to the point where like, you can count like very few journalists really seen inside the country being able, independent journalists being able to actually produce some uh, some quality reports. And then, um, uh, and then uh, there is a few issue of the state uh, propaganda and the state uh, media trying to attack the Belarusian pro-democratic forces, also blocking the access uh, to independent information, uh, to um, independent media uh, news portals. And uh, let alone there was the system case where the Russian propaganda uh, where uh, groups were sent to Belarus to sort of produce the narrative that would preserve the status quo and sort of condemn the, the protest. And one remark uh, before um, regarding the Chinese role, which was sort of visible uh, before the crisis, but uh, before political crisis, but during the beginning of pandemic, as in other countries, was this trend where, let's say, they were uh, attempts by Chinese side to purchase some ads or promote China-friendly narratives via, let's say, like private means and, and purchases some ads. This role was uh, overtaken by the Belarusian state media in Belarus. And it was interesting to see how the uh, like Belarusian state uh, major news agencies were um, sort of amplifying voices favorable for uh, for China and also portraying this uh, this image that the West is sort of failing during the pandemic, but at the same time, uh, China is a responsible, a uh, new global actor we should all uh, look up to in terms of uh, settling uh, standards. And then coming to the current uh, media landscape and the threats, uh, I would say that, of course, like for uh, skin on, on, on the like, state channels of communication, what they try to retranslate, when you oftentimes would see some uh, defamation attacks against the Belarusian democratic forces and also uh, and also some uh, actual like uh, evidences of tortures and forced confessions. Uh, but then when it comes to, again, this is the state created narrative to, to deal with the uh, like dissidents. But when it comes to uh, China, oh, like Russia's interest in this whole uh, process, uh, I would say, like, well, uh, Kremlin State, sort of the beneficiary of turmoil in Belarus, is in this kind of uncertainty to strengthen its positions. And here, what is uh, interesting is the, uh, sort of the, the venue of Telegram channels. And as you might have uh, known, the Telegram channels were a source of communication exchange for information during the protests when the internet was blocked in Belarus. And there were still some work around to uh, get into Telegram channels, to get some updates on what, what is going on, where, where the police are sitting people, etc. And uh, this popularity of Telegram channels remained in Belarus as of today. And of course, there are multiple channels like state crazy Belarusian uh, propaganda uh, channels but also the anonymous channels which are most likely related to Russia which sort of feed the so-called insider information about the talks let's say like what Putin had mind regarding Belarus whether he wants to invade the country or not like what are the political plans and then um, those uh, what those kind of like anonymous but most likely Russian channels are an interesting phenomenon because say like even the Belarusian those who tend to think critically not just consume Belarusian state propaganda at this at this time of sort of like lack of information and most of the like actual like independent uh, sources are blocked they come sort of prone to believe in this kind of analysis which are published you don't know by whom and who stand behind it. And what is also interesting is that before crisis, there was a network of Russian-backed um, regional news channels in Belarus, which, uh, uh, as uh, some of investigators showed, they were uh, launched by Kremlin-related uh, sources, financed by Kremlin, and they exist for a while. They were not used to full capacity, and after the political crisis, they ceased to exist. So essentially, someone decided to cut the financing for them, but it looks to me that say, like those cha those money were uh, resources are relocated to this um, like maintaining those anonymous uh, Telegram channels. 
Uh, and one of the interesting, um, again, uh, maybe the most recent examples is the current migration crisis, obviously, at the Belarus EU border, and that there are some uh, sort of uh, disinformation attempts or the, like, uh, the, uh, the fake videos also disseminated through this, like, fake accounts or unknown, uh, like, accounts of unknown origin, which show that the, let's say, like, the, the police or the Polish side, uh, the border control are actually, like, shooting or origin migrants, and then it turns out that this was a, just a uh, disinformation um, attack, and uh, there are, pr- uh, like, actual proofs that uh, show that this was fake. But this also comes at very sensitive side with the sort of like increasing pressures at the uh, EU border and some uh, some expectations this won't escalate to some sort of like actual like cultural confrontation maybe. Uh, so uh, I, I think I'll stop here, but also like underline that uh, at the moment uh, like we Belarusians exist in this uh, time of chaos, but at the same time. There are uh, the, um, the sort of enormous efforts of the Belarus who managed to relocate really abroad. They tend to ban this uh, fakes and also to expose like the the ties of the malign efforts, uh, malign actors, uh, external actors, how they try to say influence the Belarusian agenda. But initial, uh, essentially, the journalists are picked uh, from abroad currently. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katya. Uh, so last but not least, I would give the word t- uh, to uh, Victoras. Uh, so please, what is your opinion about regulation of the media? And I'm, I mean, uh, if I'm correct, Lithuania has specific experience with banning certain media channels spreading disinformation. Again, we can discuss what are the pros and cons. But uh, in general, I would really uh, like to hear, hear your take uh, on our topic. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, yes, uh, in Baltic states, we have some of this experience. Uh, um, it's good and bad. Uh, so kind of this information problem uh, is, is quite wide and, and wide reaching and uh, there is no one single solution. Uh, but I think that uh, the most important thing is to prioritize. If we're trying to tackle all the problems at the same time, that, that is not leading anywhere, basically. And uh, the discussions uh, depend a lot if we are speaking at the EU level, if we are speaking at uh, worldwide level, or we are speaking at country level, and different rules should apply. And uh, uh, today's topic is called media regulation. So, you know, media, it's quite well regulated. You know, journalists are quite well regulated almost all around the world. Uh, but there are all the new new actors, bloggers, bloggers, uh, influencers, and uh, there's a lot of people who who even lot of citizens who even cannot differentiate between those. And uh, the generation Z even does not differentiate between TV and and YouTube. So uh, I think this is important to speak like what could should be done to with the other. Uh, novel forms of media and how they should be, uh, how they should take responsibility of what is their content and what is the consequences of that content being published. Um, there's a lot of actors that spread this information systematically to create harm and uh, to kind of degrade the democratic societies, uh, to degrade the West culture, and to run these huge influence campaigns. And I think we need to separate uh, between mis- and disinformation. And uh, in this point in time, that would be good enough. Uh, So if the action of spreading lies is systematic and with intent to harm and if you run an analysis over longer time period that is not actually that that hard to prove and uh, we mapped out what a lot of sources that do that systematically and yet there are no consequences covid crisis uh the world crisis showed that uh, how impactful information can be and uh, uh, you know, we, we are still yet to find out when uh, academic community will work further with this and investigate how many people actually died because of this disinformation campaigns, how many people died because of these uh, 
foreign country influence disinformation campaigns and so on. So that will be something uh, really interesting to see. And that should be something, some eye opener for policymakers to react and to think uh, how to prevent this from happening ever again. Uh, speaking on social media, so there are some things that are really weird. Uh, Facebook makes, I don't know, 9 billion profit uh, per quarter, and uh, so big news, a lot of money. And then 90% of all of the readership of Facebook, it's outside US, but only 30%, 13% of content moderation is outside US. So that's how much resources and effort are actually put. So there is a clear problem of transparency. All and and it's not about only Facebook or or, or Google about the big tech. There is many more social media companies are running these running these operations and and creating influence in society. So they have to. There should be more rules how uh, these transparency issues would be solved. How researchers as as all of us uh, could access the data and and review find the issues, communicate them, um, and uh, push for, for more uh, policy changes. Uh, example, uh, another example for, from COVID disinformation, the Baltic. So in the first six months of 2021, we have found uh, around half a million content pieces on COVID. And um, in, in the more general term, we, we would call it a hostile media. So that's the websites uh, that, that we monitor. So we have mapped around 3,000 websites that are connected either with authoritarian regimes or with disinformation networks or, or other actors that tend to create these influence campaigns. And uh, those are in third languages. So uh, analyzing those, uh, in the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Poland, so we found half a million content pieces, uh, also including uh, posts on, on Facebook. And uh, from those, we predicted 35,000 to be potentially most harmful content-wise and also most viral. And in those, we discovered 9,300 cases of mis- and disinformation. And a lot of these actors uh, spread these lies systematically. They run these campaigns and uh, Yet uh, there, there is no kind of effect or, or any responsibility uh, because of that. And I see that the main uh, few main problems that are very clear. Uh, social media problem cannot be solved at a country level. It is impossible to solve it uh, for each of the countries separately. It should be solved either at EU level or at world level. And we could uh, everyone needs to find this common agreement how to how to deal with this. When we speak about uh, media that typically spread disinformation or uh, are owned or work as a proxies, proxies to authoritarian regimes, that's another problem. They can be uh, called public broadcasters, they can be called uh, businesses or whatever uh, shell they take. But the thing is that uh, they, they get the tasks to get to, to, to do the job and, and, and they get it done. And uh, uh, at this point in time, there is they, they take no responsibility because they are basically regulated in the country from which they are coming from. And uh, uh, that is quite a big problem. And uh, we see uh, the rates of uh, low, low vaccinations. Uh, we see uh, quite many surveys done on what is uh, how many what is the percentage of populations believing in conspiracy theories. And in some countries, it's more than 50 or 55 percent, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, before COVID, uh, we, we would never had this kind of discussion. And uh, COVID is a world crisis that you know, there are already many people died because of the COVID, because of uh, not getting the vaccines and so on. And uh, there are the actors who use this crisis to communicate, to, to gain political points, to, to gain popularity, to spread this information, to, to achieve other tasks. And the question is when uh, when they will get the responsibility or when they should take the responsibility for, for, for this communication. Uh, I think always it's best to speak about the uh, actual examples because otherwise it's very theoretical and hard to explain. So, so the current a hybrid attack against the Baltic states and, and Poland uh, 
started by uh, Lukashenko's regime, it's a it's a clear example of uh, how how bad it can be, how regime can use actual people as as means of polit political pressure, push them to the border, uh, and uh, and it's very interesting that uh, uh, regime puts the responsibility on European Union when actually. Uh, they themselves invited all of those people. They provided 70 free countries, visa-free regimes. Uh, they invited, they advertised, they hired Iraqi guys uh, to advertise it even further. And then suddenly those migrants are led to Lithuanian, Polish, Latvian borders by uh, the in institutions uh, of Belarus, by the border control and other green walking people. So uh, this is a really big deal and big form. And currently the only response is the sanctions. And uh, it's important that EU establish the sanctions that actually uh, create economic pain and actually would start to work. But basically there is no other way. So the sanctions currently is, is, is the only tool that, that EU and, and the world has against these types of actions. And uh, clearly, that is that is not the situation that we all want to be. So regimes can use real people; they don't have responsibility. Uh, if if uh, we would apply the international law, basically, if they invited the people, they should take care of those people. But what they are doing, they they are creating a humanitarian crisis, then sending uh, the teams of uh, disinformants and propagandists and shooting the videos. This week we had a case when uh, there was a child and uh, older migrant and he was just uh, blowing the cigarette smokes, the eyes of the child, so the child would cry and, uh, you know, would be full in tears and, and then they would shoot a video, go to the, uh, to the border and ask for permission to, to go over it. Hope you can still hear me. Uh, so basically, these um, these examples are really dangerous. And uh, with this crisis, what we have seen happening is that uh, this uh, these disinformation actors, propagandists, uh, they produce so much content, and uh, other other journalists cannot access uh, the the border regions. And uh, basically, in international media now, we see a lot of of the content that is, was created either by Kremlin or Minsk regime. And uh, that is when there is lack of official communication then you, or, or real journalism, then you have a perfect place to spread uh, or disinformation to spread. So where I would put more efforts, I would say that attribution is one of the biggest deals and the most important thing if you want to solve and deal with the problem of disinformation. If we could attribute, where is it coming from? And the attribution is possible. Uh, only uh, we need transparency and open data from social media companies. We need to have open registries from all the media organizations that are actually registered and working. And then the actual attribution can happen. So transparency is one of the ways to solve. And then uh, European Union, uh, other international organizations need to find agreement on how to agree on the new rules of the game. So there would be a clear responsibility of taking what's being communicated. Thank you very much, Victoras. I would uh, now just like to very quickly remind our audiences that if you have any questions or comments towards our speakers, please uh, do use the comment section under the streaming uh, wherever you are uh, watching us. Uh, we will see it. Uh, and in the meantime, I have a couple of follow-up questions to all of you. Also, if you want to respond to each other, please use the time uh, the time as well. I would like to uh, start with the first question to Marketa Gregorova. I, during your initial remarks, you mentioned that media needs state support uh, in order to be able to gain and uh, have trust of uh, the audiences as opposed to disinformation sites. My question would be what this support is supposed to look like and where is the line between 
supporting them in their quality journalism and where there should be the line uh, which is already leading towards, uh, let's say, doubts about their independence. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, when I when I uh, thought about this point, I, I knew that it might raise some questions. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, we cannot pretend that there is not a problem from the side of uh, uh, you know the manipulated media or the. Uh, so-called journalism that is just purely for spread of disinformation and even though i am not a huge fan of uh, of let's say uh, interference from the government or state because i think this can also and as you mentioned uh go uh, go uh, go uh, in a in a wrong direction i uh, do think that we need to somehow strengthen the quality journalism and in this regard there are several several ways we can of course strengthen it uh, some of them are more long term some of them are uh, short term uh, the more long term ones are actually uh, supporting even financially uh, you know universities with uh, journalistic programs supporting uh, supporting uh, groups uh, of uh, independent uh, fact checkers uh, which is slightly not uh, which is not directly you know um, pouring money into journalism but it actually helps also to uh, let people grow in this regard and let them grow in uh, this uh, uh, this topic and work and of course the uh, more short term uh, apart from these and some legislative changes uh, is uh, support in terms of uh, in terms of financing into uh, into the uh, mostly state uh, state state-controlled uh, media uh, and uh, of course uh, finances is something that uh, the media are already receiving so I wouldn't consider it uh, to be a, such a huge uh, such a huge interference from the side or uh, from the side of state of course it needs to remain fully independent uh, however uh, the independence is also difficult to reach if you are forced to have a, a specific amount of viewers otherwise you won't be able to uh, to pay the bills uh, therefore uh, and it shows actually even like in Czech Republic on our state media that sometimes they are kind of forced to go uh, for the most hot topic at the moment rather than what's important and uh, this this should help it but yes of course it should be very sensitive uh, very sensitive involvement Thank you. Sorry, it just took me a while to turn on my mic back again. Uh, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, with that, I, I would like to turn to Monica. Uh, so basically, you also talked a little bit about the problem with the erosion of public trust into media. So I was wondering if you could also follow up a little bit on uh, how do you think we could increase the public trust into democratic institutions and media? Uh, and secondly, uh, Victor has before uh, before this mentioned that sanctions are basically the only way we can respond to the bad actors uh, in terms of uh, some kind of uh, increasing the cost. I would want to ask if you agree with that or if you think there are also other types of deterrence we could use uh, and if there are some other types of sanctions maybe for the EU to use when it comes to uh, targeting bad actors like Russia or China or any other spreaders of disinformation and propaganda. Thank you. Uh, so I'll take those questions in reverse order. Um, first, when it comes to the um, uh, foreign aggressors, um, I mean, I think sanctions are an essential part of the um, resistance or deterrence uh, toolkit, if you will. Um, particularly uh, mechanisms like Magnitsky sanctions that really hurt um, the um, um, elites that are in charge of the um, um, policies and that don't actually, you know, um, um, hurt people uh, or or the or the countries um, more more broadly, right? I mean, we we want to target these solutions as narrowly as we can to the individuals that are um, responsible at the political and the leadership level 
um, for this kind of uh, for this kind of damage uh, and aggression. Um, so I would say that that sanctions are the number the number one tool. Really, I mean, what it's about though is um, making the um, the um, regimes and the um, you know key constituent figures of those regimes um, persona non grata uh, in our um, uh, you know in our democracies. Um, we we want to um, basically excise them to the greatest possible degree from the access to our institutions and to our liberties, to our rule of law that they so crave to you know hide their money, send their kids to school here. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, so that's that's really what we have to um, crack down on, um, in my opinion, and that also requires obviously closing the loopholes that we have domestically, um, and um, investigating the the tentacles of influence that that um, result in sort of elite and institutional co-optation to a certain degree. I mean. You know, we see this in some, you know, some countries very prominently. We see it in Germany extremely prominently. Um, we see it um, in, in the UK, in the city of London. Um, we see it elsewhere. Um, I mean, those are by no means the only the only two countries. Um, the United States, where um, I'm I'm from, partly uh, is also increasingly um, looking at this question um, through anti-corruption legislation. So that's. That's also what we have to crack down on, right? Because again, when it comes to disinformation or media exploitation as part of the hybrid agenda, I mean, that's just the very, very tip of the iceberg when it comes to malign influence. Um, and so in that regard, we have to be um, much uh, broader thinking um, in our strategies to limit that kind of influence. Um, and to really understand ultimately that that this is um, you know a a um, really I would say existential conflict between democracy and authoritarianism, um, and it requires choosing a side and and fighting for it um, without uh, equivocation or uh, thinking that that there is a middle way that you know somehow um, um, you know we can. Um, cooperate in um, economic or, or other domains and then um, nonetheless protect our interests um, where those might come under threat. Um, really that's it for, um, um, for the uh, regimes in, in the Kremlin and in Moscow and in Beijing, um, you know, Different areas of, of policy are not are not siloed um, and um, administered independently. They are all part um, of of the same kind of top down package. And we in the West, unfortunately, because of the division of powers that you know are kind of a fundamental feature of democracy, we are not used to dealing with or responding to. Um, um, you know, powers or, or, or regimes that basically can weaponize all of these different dimensions uh, in pursuit of a larger, grander um, subversion strategy. Um, so that's that's one side of the issue. Um, the um, the other side. Okay, you'll have to remind me of what the first question was. Um, it was about it was about media, but but please but please step in and remind me. <laughs> it was about uh, how we can uh, help increase the trust people to, you know, quality journalism and professional media. Right. Um, well, I'm um, um, I'm a little bit distressed that this hardest question of all is being directed um, only towards me because, you know, it, that's I, I would say that that is that is the hardest um, that is the hardest answer or the hardest question to answer. Um, uh, I think that to some degree it, it you know varies from from country to country. I think that that there are legitimate reasons um, why there is diminishing trust. I mean the the fundamental uh, kind of thing that we have to remember when we talk about this um, subject is that um, um, I mean the the um, um, political um, uh, deficiencies that that we that we face um, the uh, um, polarization um, and again lack of um, or loss of trust uh, in, in institutions. I mean that is not explicitly um, 
caused by social media. It's not, it's not caused um, fundamentally or essentially by um, the digital information disorder. That certainly exacerbates it. But um, I mean, we have to look a little bit more critically um, at you know what what the what the causes, the broader kind of you know sociological causes um, and economic causes of of these uh, tendencies are. Um, why is it that that populism is increasingly appealing? Um, you know, it's it's not simply because we've been radicalized by social media, but it's because um, you know democracy in in you know many countries and for a lot of people, you know, hasn't delivered um, on its promises. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of, you know, the perceptions of um, um, elitism that, you know, I certainly think that, um, or I, I mean, I saw that we faced, you know, while I was working in the EU that I, that I see as someone, you know, um, basically as, you know, an elite myself, if you will, right, connected to political and to expert communities we are often detached from the concerns of, of ordinary people. Um, and so we can't think about, um, you know, um, basically regulating the problem away somehow just by constraining social media and think that that's going to be a panacea, a cure-all um, for what is basically broader and oftentimes, you know, more legitimate discontent and grievance. Um, um, with um, with the level of opportunity um, that that people have, um, and those I mean those are those are difficult questions. Those are questions that you know paradoxically are harder to address in constructive ways um, in a time of of you know greater polarization and mistrust. So the task ahead of us um, is very great. Um, I, I don't know what what the recipe for um, for that is. Um, it's it's very broad. It requires you know a lot of cohesion. Um, certainly, though, as you know, first step, I think that um, doing what we can um, to create a public interest digital sphere to envision what kind of digital architecture, what kind of internet we want that serves the interests of democracy to at least reduce that um, exacerbation effect that we're seeing. I mean, that should be a, a priority. And I'm delighted to see that um, the European Union is, is taking this seriously. Um, you know, absolutely, I think the EU um, through, through the DSA is, the, the Digital Services Act, excuse me, uh, is leading the way in this respect. Um, far more so, for example, than we're going to see in the United States uh, for our own political partisan reasons. So, thank you, Monica. Uh, let me now maybe turn to Victoras. Uh, Victoras uh, before a lot about sanctions, but uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, your organizations, which I'm sorry I mispronounced the name before, debunkeu.org, is actually doing a lot to support local journalists and fact checking and debunking fake news and basically. Uh, protect your local or regional space from uh, disinformation, be it foreign or, or domestic. So I just wanted to ask you if you could elaborate a little bit more on your organization's activities in this area and what have been the results? What would you say the impact of your work has been so far? So, uh, yes, uh, I started with the sanctions. That's because that's that's the recent case that we see. So, you know, this year we had uh, Ryanair plane takeover or takedown with a with the two military planes uh, redirecting and and then landing at Minsk. So that was the, the first start with um, uh, with sanctions. Then uh, then came all the others. And now we having these uh, all of these illegal migrants next to the border and uh, so yeah, so currently we see that sanctions are uh, implemented. They are not perfect, uh, but um, uh, it, uh, it seems that they are working. And uh, it, uh, it, from the reactions and uh, from further uh, escalation, how things go, it seems that it's working, but it's still imperfect. From the analysis perspective, so we run a lot of the analysis to analyze uh, how this 
how these information stories are created, how they are being spread, how the fake websites are established, how they are taken over by a bigger website, then then by another bigger website, and then then unfolding, and then finding a campaign in social media, then then we see videos created, and so on. So we kind of follow the trails and uh, all these digital trails to, to find where it's coming from, to whom it's useful. And basically, for all the analysis, fact-checking and debunking, the most important thing is attribution. It's actually, can you find who's actually responsible for this and who's actually doing that? And uh, before we do any regulation or, or policy changes, if the problem of attribution is, uh, if we are not able to solve the problem of attribution, any policy changes, they, they will not make sense because in any court, in, in any legal system, if you cannot attribute, you, you, you cannot take any action as well. So I think that is um, uh, quite a low hanging fruit uh, for European Union, for international organizations to deal with it. And every time there is a light shed on all of these lies and conspiracies, they, they quickly die, like in the movies. So I think that is uh, quite a simple thing. If there is more uh, data openness from social media, if it's more data openness uh, from about the information, about the news outlets, about influencer accounts, where are they coming from, uh, who's paying them, how they are getting the money. Uh, so these things are not that hard. You know? So it's more a question of an actual will to do that. And when this is done, all of us will you know, it will, our lives will become easier and we can actually do even better analysis and report quicker and faster to respond to, to what's actually happening there. And uh, uh, from the media perspective, I think that, uh, you know, so just look at the last 100 years in the media. So if you take uh, just every time uh, you take a longer perspective, uh, somehow everything becomes more clear. So we had newspapers and newspapers were paid and everyone paid for the newspapers and like no one had a question that they need to pay for the newspaper. And uh, then the Internet age came and everyone uh, and the media started to work online and suddenly all of the media became for free and the newspapers died and then they needed to, to find new business models. And that was kind of a big revolution. And we are still living uh, in that age that there's a lot of free things at least we think that they are free but actually they are not there's a lot of data being sold back and forth there's a lot of algorithms built on on online people behavior and that's how people pay now for for how they get the news and now we are entering a new stage of metamorphosis in, in media is that when media are becomes paid again so there's a kind of big trend all around the world that uh, media companies are starting subscription models, which is uh, really uh, even bigger revolution than uh, of uh, papers going to online to, to you know, to, to make paid something that was made free for the last 30 or 40 years. That is dramatically uh, hard to do. But this is not something new, you know, before everyone paid for it. So so why it was so bad? So basically with media, the main thing is how do you fund, fund professional journalism? If you have, uh, you know, uh, proper salaries and uh, there's a lot of people who want to be journalists. And if the, the regulation is there, people will do the work. So kind of agreeing on the rules of the game and how it's transparently funded and, and kind of uh, bigger parts of the problem are solved. So I think we are in this interesting place. Uh, and um, uh, depending from the country, the journalist level, uh, of course, differentiate a lot. Uh, and everywhere where it's underfunded, uh, it's, it is problematic. Uh, stepping out, out of that, I, again, I want to come back to social media and other tech companies, because this part, neither the transparency work, neither uh, neither the regulation so kind of it's it's the worst that, that you can have 
So here is actual response needed. And uh, uh, in EU, when the social media and the big tech does the reports, yeah, so they do the reports on, on monthly, sometimes quarterly basis, and uh, that's the first steps to transparency. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of debates uh, if, if they can actually do uh, regional or country reports. So uh, I'm coming from the technology world. So last 15 years I worked in, in the tech. And so the answer is yes, absolutely they can. It's, it's just that they, they don't want uh, to show all the problems. That's why, so it's easier to hide when uh, when it's done in, in regions or, or worldwide and so on. So the technical possibilities are there. The, the, the actual will is lacking. The resources with one quarter, nine billion profits, the resources are there as well. So again, so it's just a question of regulation and uh, agreement of, of the rules and uh, how to avoid these um, this typical spreaders who do it systematically. So we should focus on the ones who create harm on a systematic basis, and uh, that is provable. Yeah, I think the political will in general is something that we have been calling for in many countries for several years now. And uh, somehow we still haven't really cracked the golden, golden point where we will know how to how to make uh, things moving, even though many of us actually know what or believe that we know what actually should be done. Uh, Oksana, there is actually a question for you from the audience, from Maya Mateshvili from Georgia. As far as I know, pro Kremlin TV channels are banned in Ukraine. Would you say this measure works well in curbing amplification of disinformation? Is it being protested by certain groups of the local population? Will, will it be up for consideration anytime soon? Uh, yes, since uh, January, if I'm not mistaken, of the current year, uh, sanctions were imposed uh, by the government upon three pro-Russian TV channels. But what we see in reality, it was just a short time measure because they just changed their names and they uh, re relaunched their broadcasting just on other platforms and by our estimates they just uh, have the same audience right now as they used before and here i agree with my uh, with colleagues who were talking that uh, we need a um, systematic approach and good media regulation in ukraine we have the weakest regulator in europe uh, uh, our law on television and radio is was adopted in uh, 1993 and we really need media reform uh, to introduce transparency responsibility uh, to deal with media oligarchs at the market very essential and such measures as uh, internal sanctions Okay, they work for some short period of time, but they cannot solve the like global problem because this information comes. Uh, we are living in the world full of information. It's very easy to spread this information, and I really feel that disinformators and manipulators they are better equipped than those people who try to <laughs> fight against this information. Uh, they are. Uh, even have more uh, tools, more instruments provided to them by social platforms, while uh, we feel that social platforms are really hostile to researchers uh, in terms of like closing this um, programmatic uh, They closed it like after the year 2018. So, um, we really need, I think I agree with my colleagues that we need a new uh, approach to this regulation. Uh, for sure, we need a global uh, approach to sanctions. They do work if they are imposed uh, by like European Union and uh, other countries. And yes, there is a strong need in support to transparent and professional journalism uh, journalists now 
instead they, that they can sell but only in case when people trust them a big demand now for, uh, among journalists they are looking uh, at the market of editorial policy what is that uh, we produce uh, like a kind of uh, ranking we produce monitoring of transparency of media market and uh, media who are not transparent and us letters and say oh we didn't know that uh, add uh, like uh, information about the chief editor about the media owner at the website please uh, improve us in your like rating because for us trust is very important the issue of trust transparency professional uh, journalism professional standardism ethics is very essential uh, and I think um, the crisis is still ahead <laughs> of us. And um, but this is a professional journalism that is the answer. This transparency and tribulation. Um, independent journalism should be supported. Quite cautious about about state support <laughs> but uh i think the public broadcast companies uh, are uh, also important players a field that can be supported on online media and probably um regional media that are interested in uh, transparency as well and interest in trust of their audiences they have very good perspectives actually coronavirus showed uh, how people deal with media very well it showed how people were looking for information uh in, in what types of media they sit in you know and we are in online media are uh, like uh, have better trust than television and uh, well, I think um, a key in uh, like developing online media and developing this uh, professional uh, approach to that, and of media literacy. But it's a very long pro evolution, and it may take like tens of years. But for the moment, uh, support for independent, uh, transparent media is very, very crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Uh, and uh, next, I would like to ask Katya. So I, and to follow up on what she said in your initial remarks, I think there is no doubt that the situation for journalists, independent journalists and civil society in Belarus is very, very bad at the moment. So my question uh, would be what, first of all, what can the West or the EU or the EU member states do now to support uh, those people who are still fighting in Belarus? And second of all, uh, where can we actually turn uh, when we want credible uh, and trustworthy information about what is happening in Belarus? Um, so maybe answering your first question uh, from the position of a political analyst and someone who is thinking, like what could be the policy from the West to support Belarus in terms of crisis? I would say that actually like, channeling money to support independent media uh, that are now located outside the country is maybe the most easiest step from the West, really. And this is something that has been really uh, implemented. And this is what the foreign leaders uh, promised to, I would say, Belarusian democratic forces, just because it uh, also sort of requires less a commitment or like less carries less risk than introduced in actual let's say like sexual sanctions or which could be painful for even like EU companies dealing with Belarus. So essentially this is a support independent media. This is something that is uh, on the agenda wherever whether it's sort of the promises from Washington or from Brussels. And I don't see again like I'm not a media expert so I'm not really like uh, maybe I don't see the peculiarities or the laws of this uh, sort of um, uh, help and maybe like the journalists are like oh we need more money or we need this and that priorities but again like as a political analyst I I see that that's essentially like easiest step that the West could implement and then when we talk about independent information uh, I would like there are plenty of um, 
Belarusian besides, so let's say like Belarus Caucus or or even like Kyrgyzstan or Belsat, like those, um, um, the Belarusian media tend to uh, they tend to exist, but they exist in exile. And I would say like most of the challenges are uh, coming for the Belarusians inside the country because there the internet access is locked, and also people are prosecuted for even. Like if there is a um, sort of some extremist so-called uh, dangerous channels, or like if uh, the police finds out that you are subscribed to social media to some independent channels of information, so that's more of a challenge on the on the Belarusian side and around. But they, again, like I would say that there has been plenty of international coverage when the um, international broadcasters uh, talk quite a lot about Belarus, and uh, there's uh, quite a lot of um, information internationally. And then listening to your uh, previous remarks about the panelists, I also, um, it recalled me these sort of crisis times when the Russian independent community uh, journalists sort of existed inside Belarus. And at that time, uh, we had the uh, Belarus Press Club also to, unfortunately, later, of course, like fall under pressure like everyone else. But before that, uh, the Press Club had a team of uh, fact checkers and also introduce sort of the best practices um recommendations to fellow independent journalists how to create good quality materials and they uh, made this reviews of the sort of fellow independent um uh, journalist materials somehow like sometimes like criticizing them or or praising them to sort of for if you're interested the best international journalist standards and at the same time they pointed out like what could be done better uh, for the state media if they want to um sort of uh, follow the international best practices and what i'm saying is that um well i don't i don't expect that in the near term we would see um the time when the actual like British government would uh, think about like the best international uh eternal practices and, and about being sort of impartial uh, but uh, the Belgian journalist community is aware of those uh, sort of threats and uh, they have this willingness to um, to also provide some sort of peer review and uh, some like, criticism and, and suggestions uh, and uh, well, uh, at least like this is something, certain practices we've done before and hopefully we will implement them somehow um, after the crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, so my last question today would be the same to all of you. Uh, and because we have the last couple of minutes, I would ask you to be brief, even though the question might seem a little big as it usually is uh, for the for the closing remarks. So basically, uh, actually a lot of you during uh, your speeches or answers mentioned uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and rightfully so. Uh, it has been when it comes to disinformation specifically, a very much of a mirror to our, to our state of play because during COVID pandemic, we have seen disinformation spreading globally from foreign actors and domestic actors. Uh, affecting public health uh, and on all possible platforms. So basically everything, every problem you can imagine when it comes to disinformation, we have seen in the last uh, uh, last months uh, of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, as I said, it showed us or it shows us still a kind of a mirror. How prepared are we to face those kinds of campaigns? Uh, you know, the discussion about disinformation being a problem has been taking since at least 2014. Uh, and now we're in 2021 and the biggest crisis yet has come upon us. So my question uh, for all of you uh, for the very end is how prepared are we? What are the what is the main lesson we should learn from the current crisis? Uh, because uh, if, uh, you know, if the pandemic and the sort of connected infodemic hasn't shown us how much of this is actually a problem, not for political analysts or for experts from think tanks, but really for every single person, uh, uh, probably nothing else, uh, nothing else would. So I would start, uh, well, I would probably ask you in the same order as uh, the initial remarks. So please, uh, Marketa Gregorova, could you please start? 
Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I will actually dare to connect it to my recent uh, uh, visit of Taiwan, uh, speci specifically because of their uh, countering of foreign interference and disinformation. And that is because uh, their, uh, let's say, communication regarding the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and their following up on the rules is really something else. It's uh, really unique. And uh, what I've learned or what we, we've learned as our mission is that it is vastly based on a public trust towards their authorities and the communication from the authorities towards the public. For instance, in terms of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, since the beginning of the pandemic, each day five doctors uh, uh, are uh, on the national TV and are explaining how many new cases are there, why, why do they need to enforce certain uh, certain rules, etc. It is uh, quite unimaginable to some of the uh, European countries or most of them, uh, considering that of course a lot of politicians want to want to go to the TV and explain it, uh, even though they are not experts on that. But here in this case, they are using doctors. Uh, on the same regard, they are building trust in the long term with their citizens. They are communicating with them. They have a very transparent uh, government. Uh, their premier, uh, the prime minister and president are uh, both communicating on social media. They also use, use humor over rumor, as they like to say. So they are authentic and human, you know, and uh, I think that this is something that we should take uh, as um, as a uh, example as an example because I think that with resilient society uh, it is much easier to discuss what to do about certain information uh, campaigns or certain actors because you already have resolved or very you know <laughs> uh, helped the situation on the receiving end so that would be my last remark. Thank you very much. Uh, so next, Monica. Uh, and I would li like to ask you all to keep your answers within two minutes tops. Um, yeah, so super quickly. I mean, I think the um, um, COVID-19 pandemic and its weaponization, um, particularly by, by Russia and China, um, illustrated the degree to which um, we were completely unprepared, um, especially in Europe, to um, um, basically respond in, in such a crisis situation. Um, the European Union in particular was caught with its pants down. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate because we, we should have anticipated that a crisis like this would be weaponized by um, the very same actors who have a track record of doing this. Um, I'm not sure whether um, um, we have learned from it adequately. Um, I certainly think that, that um, some people have taken the, um, the important lessons, um, but whether or not we will be able to uh, implement solutions um, um, quickly enough, particularly given the fact that this is a, um, um, you know, uh, threat field, if you will, that's um, uh, or landscape that is evolving very quickly. Um, we always run the risk of our um, um, solutions and our action, um, you know, taking taking too long, and then when we're finally at that point, the problem is somewhere else. Um, so I'm I'm fairly pessimistic. Um, uh, I think that we have a very long way to go. Um, I am encouraged by the fact that, again, as I've mentioned before, that the EU is moving forward um, with more ambitious um, regulatory uh, proposals in the context of the DSA than we have seen to date, um, and that our, you know, there is no comparison anywhere anywhere else. Um, the quicker uh, that, that that happens, uh, the better for us all. Thanks. Thank you very much, Monica. So next, uh, I would like to ask Oksana. Uh, I think our response should be common. Uh, is always better than a response by a single country. And we should respond at two levels. First of all, first is uh, develop uh, or participate in development of this common 
regulation for social platforms or uh, th this is really on time already and second uh, if we can uh, prove that this information comes from russia and china and it really uh, kills people because people uh, like believe this disinformation about COVID vaccination, and it's a very huge blow to public security, to public health. I think the response should be at the level, for instance, sanctions, a, some new sanctions against, I don't know, Russia, Russian officials, whatever. If we know that the source of this information, uh, and they are really responsible for this, I think uh, this issues should be raised uh, and uh, maybe new sanctions are necessary here. They really, really uh, invest in that and we see it here in Ukraine. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, next I would like to give the word to Katya. So I think what COVID teaches us is that it underlines the effects or the conflicts and tensions in the ideologies and the sort of international uh, tensions. And uh, by this I mean, let's say how even like Belarusian example, how for the matter of survival, say of the uh, Belarusian regime, they tend to rebalance uh, their foreign policy options towards Russia and China. And hence, uh, tend to be more, uh, much more prone to those kind of narratives, and and be tempted to promote those kind of narratives. And this also applies not only to Belarus, but also, let's say, to some uh, recipients of the own initiatives who not only tend to be less uh, vocal about, let's say, criticizing China internationally, international bodies, but also tend to be maybe more. Um, uh, ready to praise like those kind of like vaccine diplomacy and uh, and the China's constructing this favorable image of let's say Russia and China versus uh, the the West. Thank you very much, Katya. And uh, last but not least, uh, the final word, please. Uh, it's yours, Victoras. So I, I think what COVID learned everyone is how to disinfect stuff and how to wear masks, which was so uncommon in Europe. So probably that's a, a real lesson learned. Um, uh, what is uh, what we haven't learned, and it was clear, we're still having debates like uh, having uh, social media accounts, personal social media accounts, and having hundred thousand of followers, fifty thousand of, of followers or having groups uh, with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, and considering those groups being private. So that is a very, very weird situation. We, we consider standing in front of 10,000 people to, to have a private conversation. And yet in online, in all of these um, different apps, um, encrypted, not encrypted, and social media, this is tended to be called as private. So that is very weird, and um, uh, I think uh, COVID showed uh, everyone to how big the actual problem is. So what I would wish that uh, never waste a good crisis, and uh, decisions should be made, and uh, policy changes should await. Great, thank you. Well, I think we really had this sort of ideal mix of both optimistic and pessimistic uh, approaches and uh, opinions. So let's, uh, well, as it's usually said, let's hope for the best and be prepared for the worst. Uh, that really seems to be uh, the main message here. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much uh, to the audiences who have been with us on the online stream, but also and most especially to our uh, brilliant speakers. Uh, Marketa Grigorova, member of the European Parliament from the Czech Pirate Party, thank you. Monika Richter, uh, media expert from Semantic Visions, thank you to you as well. Oksana Romanyuk, uh, executive director of the Institute of Mass uh, Information from Ukraine, thank you. 
uh, Katerina Schmatzina, independent political analyst from Belarus, and Viktoras Daukchas, head of the debankeu.org initiative from Lithuania. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you also uh, to our co-organizer. Co this event has been uh, co-organized by European Value Center for Security Policy and text.org.ua. And it has been funded by the European Union through the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation, a project of the German Marshall Fund. So that is all for today. I hope that those of you who haven't managed to watch the stream live will, uh, will see the debate later on. Uh, for the record, and that's everything for me. My name is Veronika Vichova. I represent European Value Center for Security Policy, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing you at different occasions, either live or online again, and uh, to deb debate a little bit more about how to counter foreign influence and disinformation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.